Well, I'd like to welcome you all to the, uh, the American Museum of Natural History tonight. Um, my name is uh, Chris Raxworthy. I'm a herpetologist. I don't study uh, elephants, although I'm utterly uh, fascinated by them, study amphibians and reptiles. But uh, uh, my role here today is just basically to, uh, uh, to welcome you and also it's just to uh, summarize just super briefly a little bit about uh, uh, the museum. The museum does over 100 um, expeditions a year, and of course many of them go to Africa. So Africa is a place that we have a tremendous connection and passion for. And what you're going to hear tonight is about uh, a passion of uh, a person and a trust towards elephants and towards Africa. So I think that uh, it's going to be a very powerful and, uh, and special evening. And uh, um, I'm very privileged uh, uh, to be here tonight uh, uh, involved in this uh, event. But my main function tonight is to actually introduce um, our uh, next uh, uh, guest, who is uh, Kristen Davis. And she has a very personal, special connection with the Trust and with our uh, main speaker tonight. She uh, uh, was uh, on a safari in, in Africa in 2009, like many people uh, that would be interested in Africa, but amazingly enough, uh, as a result of this safari, she ended up rescuing uh, a baby elephant, which is, I, I think, just an amazing story. I'm sure we're going to hear it in just a couple of minutes, but it's almost like sort of going to the zoo and coming back with a gorilla, you know, uh, adopting a, a baby elephant on a safari. So uh, uh, she's um, got a very special connection, and uh, let me just uh, read out a few words here. She um, has actively spoken out for elephants and uh, promoted the work of uh, Dame Daphne Sheldrick and the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, helping to educate people all over the world about the th threat of ivory poaching. And I should just uh, mention here something which really stunned me, just uh, I discovered this a, a little while ago, is that... Um, you might think that elephants are in pretty good shape in Africa, that there's still lots of organizations conserving them, they're protected by ivory bands. But uh, since the 1970s, since in fact 1979, uh, almost two-thirds of the, um, the elephants in Africa, the population, have actually disappeared. The, the population has crashed from about 1.2 million to, uh, uh, as reading reports about estimates of about four or 500,000 elephants. So to think during most of our lifetimes, you know, since I was a, a boy, that uh, so many elephants have been lost in uh, Africa under our watch is, is really uh, uh, unbelievably shocking. Kristen Davis uh, uh, was awarded the, uh, the Weiler Award by the Humane Society of the United States last year in recognition of her efforts to use the media to help protect elephants and is currently a patron of the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. And she's going to be a powerful advocate for the trust tonight and uh, is somebody who both adores elephants and Africa and uh, uh, the mission of the trust. So please welcome uh, Kristen Davis. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a lovely introduction. And I just want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. It's a very special night for us. We have the incredible Dame Daphne Sheldrick with us, and she's going to read to you from her autobiography, which is a beautiful, beautiful book about her life and everything she's seen in Kenya. And as Chris said, I do have a very special connection. I feel very lucky to have this connection. I'd been going to Africa I think about maybe almost 10 years, and I was there on a safari, and there happened to be a horrible drought, and I was with some Maasai friends, and we were driving along a little dirt dirt road, and this elder from a village came running out and you know, flagged us down and said that there had been this, this baby elephant alone by the village at night, which is very unusual because the elephants really are like a family in the way that humans are a family, and a, a little tiny baby would never be without its mother. So they knew that something had happened to this baby's mother and that we needed to find it because they can't live very long alone without their mother's milk. So my friends and I searched and searched for this elephant for days and we were so worried. And right before this trip I had been watching 60 Minutes and I had seen a piece on Dame Daphne Sheldrick and I had thought, wow, I really would love to go and see those baby elephants. That's amazing that she does this in Nairobi. And we had kind of called around and tried to make an appointment and so then we thought, well, we've got to try to find this baby elephant and get it to the woman who knows how to save baby elephants because really she is the only woman on the planet who knows how to nurse a baby elephant elephant in a way where it can live and thrive and then be re-released into the wild, which is a very special thing and a very rare thing that a wild animal can be raised by humans and then be able to live a wild life, which 
Luckily, the ex-orphans do. So we finally found our baby. We call her our baby now. And her name is Chai Mu. And we got her. We called the trust. And they sent their keepers. And the keepers came and gave her medicine right away. And I'm happy to say that she's healthy and happy and much, much, much bigger. And living out in uh, Savo National Park. Her name is Chai Mu. You can adopt her if you would like on the website. Um, I have, I think, 10 or 15 adopted elephants and rhinos now. And um, I get so much joy from my updates from the trust every month. So that's my story. And um, through this story, I was able to meet the woman that you are about to hear from, Dame Daphne Sheldrick. And I have to say that she's one of the most inspiring women. Her whole family, all they do is try to help these animals and save this land and save these species. And they're kind of like you know, standing against this river of difficulty that the animals are facing. And I'm so proud to be able to help them. I'm so proud to be able to know them and to be able to go and visit and see the work that they do. And I just want to thank all of you because being here tonight means that you are helping them as well. So please help me in welcoming Dame Daphne Sheldrick. This is very daunting, and I'm so touched, and I'm absolutely amazed that so many people are here tonight. And uh, behind me, I'm going to, you'll be taking a journey through our photograph album, and uh, a journey through my life, which is in my book, and that's why I'm here today, to launch my autobiography, which I hope will do a lot to help the elephants. Now, I was very privileged to be born uh, into a naturalist family and uh, at a place when wildlife was very prolific everywhere. Um, we had a beautiful farm in the Rift Valley, a lovely forest behind the farm, a nice river, and there were wild animals everywhere. This is, this is our photograph album coming behind me, so uh, from my youth until I was grown and so on. But what I want to tell you is that uh, I was very privileged to have been born at a time when wild animals were everywhere, and into a family that absolutely loved animals. Now, from a very early age, I had contact, of course, with all the domestic variety because there were cats and horses and dogs and sheep and cows and everything else, but also wild animals that were brought in. And I had my first little orphaned um, bush pug when I was three or four years old. And I absolutely loved this unconditionally. I had a little bell round its neck and I fed it religiously. And I was given custody of this animal. And uh, my parents always told me that wild animals never belong. They're only on loan for as long as you need them. And if you love an animal, you must set it free. So when this little bushbuck felt the call of the wild and actually went wild, absolutely broke my heart. But anyway, that was the first lesson I learned. And uh, I had to go to uh, a boarding school in those days. That was the only option. There were no tarred roads or anything like that. It was a real safari to get to school. So boarding school was very different to what schools are today. So it was quite tough. You know, some of the teachers were real old battle axes and so on. But anyway, it was a good lesson in life. And it, it taught me to really appreciate home and my parents and everything else. So after school... Um, my brother was the very first warden of the first national park, which was Nairobi National Park, where I now live. And through him, I met my first husband, Bill Woodley, who's the father of my elder daughter. And uh, I often, I'm a great believer in destiny. Um, I had to first marry Bill in order to get to David. And uh, <laughs> Bill was transferred to Savo, and uh, we went to go and live in Savo. I met Bill when I was still a schoolgirl at 15. I never had another boyfriend and married him at 18. I had my first daughter when I was 20. Then went to live in Savo and Bill and I gradually grew apart. We changed and he fell in love with somebody else and I fell in love with David. 
But David always told me that he would never marry again because he'd been married first uh, once and it was an unhappy marriage and he was a loner and he didn't want to ever be uh, in that situation again. So although I, I learned such a lot from him and worked with him in Savo, I was able to then get to know wild animals and to study the natural behavior of elephants and so on. And he taught me a lot of what I now know. And he was also said that wild animals never actually belong. They're only with you for as long as they, they need you. Now, David had orphaned, animal, orphaned elephants. But these were elephants that were orphaned when they were two and older, that uh, weren't infants, didn't need milk. At that time, we, had, uh, we only had access to cow's milk. And nobody had ever been able to raise an infant elephant. Now, elephants are milk dependent for the first three years of life. But uh, David managed to get these two through, and they were called Samson and Fatuma, um, feeding them um, fruit and um, porridge and things like that. He managed to raise these two elephants. So when I went to live in Savo, I was very interested in these elephants. And that's when I got to know elephants pretty intimately, or I thought I did. And then uh, we, of course, in those days, there were rhinos everywhere and all the other animals as well. And I absolutely loved my time in Savo. But we went through some difficult times. The poaching got very bad. There was a lot of heartache. There, you know, there was a great die-off of elephants during a drought. And there were all sorts of controversies which are covered in my book, but I won't go into all that now. And David died very young when he was only 56, and I was just over 40 when he died. So it's been quite a long journey for me. But uh, the government very kindly gave me permission to build a little house in Nairobi National Park where I could continue to, to look after the orphaned animals. Because in Savo, while I was married to David later, we had many other um, orphaned animals. Because eventually, uh, Bill and I parted. He fell in love with somebody else. I went to work in Nairobi. My divorce came through. And eventually, I did marry David and uh, went back to live in Savo. And then we had other animals too. We had orphaned rhinos. We had some, most of the antelopes, dick dicks, el elands, all sorts of different animals. And they were all absolutely wonderful. So I learned a lot about them. And when you raise an animal, you really know how it feels and thinks. You, you learn the inside story of that animal. And uh, after David died, um, I went to live in Nairobi National Park. The government said I could build a small house there and continue my work with the animals. Well, then the little orphaned elephants started coming into a zoo situation at Nairobi National Park headquarters. And they asked me to, to look after these two elephants. Well, um, I had to drive in my own little personal car through the national park every three hours, day and night, to, fight, to feed these elephants because they had nothing there. And we managed to get tin milk. By this time, I knew that the problem with raising infant elephants was actually a fat content in the milk. They cannot digest the fat of milk, of cow's milk. And in those days, we couldn't get anything other than cow's milk. But, uh, so I managed to keep one little elephant alive for six months, Aisha. And, uh, I kept her alive on a baby milk formula called Similac, which all the fat in that formula was vegetable and mainly coconut. And that's one of the vital ingredients for elephant milk. So, but I made a mistake with the husbandry. There was, I was just the only one to look after her. And uh, when I had to leave her for a couple of weeks, because my elder daughter was getting married, um, although I substituted somebody else and my clothing for that person to wear, I thought the scent would be sufficient. Aisha died of a broken heart. And I realized then that I'd made a serious mistake with the husbandry. Because the most important thing for an elephant is the family. And they are, in fact, human animals in that respect. They have the same sense of family as us. They have all the same emotional traits. And they, they have many other things that you see in your own children. There's a little bit of jealousy, competitiveness. They're all individuals in their own right. They all have different personalities. So um, 
In Nairobi, I managed to get these two little elephants that were first brought in um, to a year old, and I managed to pers uh, um, persuade the national park authorities to allow them to go down to Savo, where we had those other elephants growing up. By then, Samson and Fatuma had gone wild, but we had another wonderful elephant called Eleanor, who'd become the matriarch there. And so I wanted to send these two babies down to become part of her herd. And I managed to do that, but they made a mistake down there, and uh, they died. So I lost the, those babies. And uh, then I, I realized, that then more started coming in. The poaching got very bad, and the director said, will you come and look after these new babies? I said, listen, I'm not going to drive through the park every three hours, day and night. I need them at my house. So that's how the nursery started, and the little elephants started coming in. And then I started really learning all sorts of things of how to raise these babies. And I recruited a team of keepers, because the first thing you have to do is replace the elephant family that they've lost with a, a, a family of humans. And it must be a family. You must have enough keepers so that the elephant doesn't get too fond of one person and too attached to that person, because when that person has time off, the elephant will go into decline and, and any psychological problems bring on diarrhea. They're very fragile in early infancy and they can be fine one day and dead the next. So rearing the elephants is a very long haul and I often think to myself, there's been such a lot of heartbreak and difficulty throughout the years in, in raising these elephants. I, with everyone that dies, I cry buckets of tears. But actually, um, having seen the elephants and how they live their lives and all the hardship that they suffer every single day and the losses that they suffer and how they grieve and mourn for every single one and how painful it is for them, but how they have the courage to turn the page and focus on the living. And a lot of people say to me, how do you carry on when there's so much tragedy and you lose so many of them? And the answer is that I try and do it like the elephants. You grieve and you mourn, that has to be. You bury that one and then you focus on the next one because there are going to be others that need your help. And I'm very proud to say that over the years I've now managed to raise successfully over 140 infant African elephants. Um, but we'd never... Uh, uh, I knew a lot about the mind of an elephant, but nobody had ever actually gone down the long haul of rehabilitating them back into a wild situation. And one has to understand that at any age, an elephant duplicates a human, so it is a long haul. And uh, the, the baby elephants are with us in the nursery for at least two years. They need milk for three years. They cannot live without it if uh, orphaned under three. And so it's every three hours, day and night, you have to replace the family with a, a, a family of humans. A different keeper has to sleep with the elephants every single night and rotate. And those same men, when the little elephants are stabilized in the nursery, will go with them to the rehabilitation stations in Savo. We have two. And we, we take them down there, we truck them in, and uh, all the keepers know all the elephants, and all the elephants know all the keepers, because they rotate around the rehab stations as well. But the most interesting thing of all is actually watching the reintegration process of these elephants. Um, and that has been very, very enlightening to me. And we've learned so much about them from the orphans, how highly intelligent they are, the communication that they have. And some of our elephants now are grown and living wild. We've got 69 of them now living wild. And the ones that are ex-orphans, those known as the ex-orphans, the other ones that are still dependent are based in the stockades at night. But the communication that goes on between those ex-orphans and the ones that are still dependent has been very, very enlightening. And it's been a learning curve and it absolutely blows your mind because you then learn how extremely intelligent and how perceptive elephants are and all sorts of mysterious abilities they have because when they leave the nursery, in the nursery, they'll be following their keepers as they would their elephant mother. 
And when they get down to Savo and they're exposed to a wild situation, there's a, there's a very subtle change. Suddenly the elephants will be communicating with others that are now living wild, bearing in mind that there are others that have preceded them through the nursery. And when they leave the nursery, the ones that are left behind in the nursery go through a grieving process because they think they've lost another member of the family. But when they go down to the rehab stations and they meet those others that they thought they'd lost, the reunion and the joy and uh, the, the welcome that they get from the others is absolutely mind-blowing. And elephants can teach us humans so much about nurturing and care. All the females absolutely love the babies. So our orphans have gradually grown up, and the ones that make the transition into the wild herd are mingling with the wild elephants quite naturally, but they look upon all the orphans as part of an extended family. And they'll come back and keep in touch with the ones that are still based at the rehabilitation stations. And then every now and then, um, one of the ones that are living wild will come back and select one that they think is ready for a night out, a sleepover. And suddenly the one that's going to have the sleepover won't want to go into the stockade at night, um, whereas usually they're rushing in to get their milk and all the goodies that are waiting for them in there. But it'll just stay out and then off they go out into the wild to join the ex-orphans who are waiting for them somewhere out in the, in the, in the bush. But elephants are very nervous and very, very, very fearful animals. And uh, they're scared even of a dick dick. So on a first sleepover, if a, a lion is roaring nearby or something like that, the little new one will get very scared. And then the matriarch, who's the oldest cow, and uh, the, of that unit is one called Yatta, uh, will detail a couple of the young bulls to escort the baby back to the stockade, hand it back to the keepers, and the keepers open up the door and it goes back into the junior lot. And, but having uh, 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 been exposed to a wild situation and lived as a wild elephant amongst the ex-orphans, and amongst the ex-orphans are also wild recruits that they've made friends with, and then you see the communication coming in. Um, how uh, the ex-orphans will be telling these wild friends, listen, these guys are different to the ones that kill us on a daily basis. These are our friends, so be nice to them. And uh, some of these wild friends actually walk with the keepers, and they're part of the orphan herd now, the ex-orphans. And you wouldn't know they weren't orphans. The keepers actually don't handle them because when the ex-orphans come back, the keepers know each one because they do have different faces and having seen them every day since they were little, they can identify individuals. So uh, we've learnt about the communication and then the, the most amazing other things that they have, uh, the, the sort of perception that they have, which we can't explain. Now, when we're moving elephants from the Nairobi nursery to the rehab station, um, Every single time this happens, the ex-orphans, who are now living perfectly normal wild lives, come back to the stockades and wait in the compound to welcome the babies. And first of all, we thought, well, they must pick this up from the keepers, who may be behaving slightly differently because there's a new influx coming from Nairobi. But there has been one situation where the, the phone signal is very bad at the rehabilitation station in the north. Uh, we weren't able to tell the keepers that there'd been a change in plan and that the elephants wouldn't be coming on this particular day, they'd be coming on another day. And uh, the keepers were very confused because suddenly all the ex-orphans turned up and were waiting in the yard. And that was very unusual because uh, they normally don't do that. They meet the babies that are dependent there somewhere out in the bush. They make a plan. Uh, but they were waiting in the yard and the keepers thought, this is really weird. I wonder why they've come back waiting. And sure enough, that day, the, although the keepers had no idea new elephants were coming from Nairobi on that particular day, and although none of the Voy elephants had ever me met the new ones that were coming, somehow they knew. Now, how they do that, I don't know. It could only be telepathy. And we also see on many occasions that the, the, suddenly the, instead of the... Um, elephants following the people, the keepers will now follow the elephants. And the little elephants that are dependent will suddenly head off as a herd in one direction. 
and the keepers just follow. And uh, when they get somewhere in the bush, there will be the ex-orphans waiting for them. And amongst the ex-orphans are many matriarchs that were matriarchs in the nursery who lead splinter groups with whoever wants to come along. And this has to be with the approval of the main matriarch. And all these sort of things are played out uh, as the elephants grow up, bearing in mind that at any age an elephant duplicates a human. So it's a very long haul. And most of the elephants are with us for at least 10 years. And because an elephant of 10 is like a human child of 10, and they're not just taken and tipped out in the bush, they go with their keepers, they, they're secured at night in the stockades, they walk in the bush. And uh, elephants are born with a genetic memory. What to eat, what not to eat is actually imprinted in the brain at birth. But in order to expose that, you have to actually expose them to a, a wild situation. And then the genetic memory, we call it instinct, comes into play. And uh, I think that they also have to learn how to communicate with infrasound. And you see this infrasound at work all the time down in the rehabilitation stations. There are occasions when some of them mix with a wild herd and they're having a nice time with little wild friends and playing together and don't actually come back to the stockades with the main group. And so the keepers are very worried, suddenly these are missing. So they open up the stockade and one of the bigger elephants will go out or send another one out and a, a couple of hours later they'll come back with the one that's missing. They find it somewhere out in the bush. And all these things happen on a daily basis. And that makes you look at elephants in a different light. And I'd always tell everyone, it takes two years to make an elephant and only nine months to make a man. So that puts it all in perspective. They, they're just like us emotionally. They're identical to us, but they're much, much better than us. They're such gentle, caring, wonderful animals. Now, we've had a wonderful thing happen now because some of the elephants that have raised from newborn in the nursery are now grown, and they're having their own wild-born calves. And every single one of them that's been raised through the nursery has brought their babies back to share with the human family that raised them at the rehab station. And when Yetta had her baby early this year, she brought, came back to the compound with 50 other elephants. Most of them were ex-orphans, all crowding around the little baby, loving it, caring it, touching it with the trunk, all wildly excited. And amongst them were wild friends too. And these wild friends really have no reason to trust or like humans. But they have to have been told by the ex-orphans, these guys are okay, these are our friends. Because the, the elephants encourage the keepers to actually go right into the herd and to handle this little newborn calf, which is only a day old, as a sheltered beneath its mother. And that's the greatest accolade you can get from the orphans themselves. Uh, thank you for having been raised them with tender, loving care and never having brutalized them. Or st our keepers never even carry a twig. And as they walk in the bush in Savo, there's a lot of danger there because they're wild buffaloes and they used to be rhinos. They're practically none of those left, unfortunately. But they, you, they're also unfriendly lions and things like this, and very unfriendly wild elephants as well, who've been poached and harassed and have no reason to be fond of uh, humans. But our, our elephants have managed to actually communicate with these wild friends that this is okay. And it's so wonderful to see all the, uh, the elephants are actually the easiest of all animals to rehabilitate, but the most difficult to rear. Now, I've also raised a whole lot of rhinos, and it's the other way around with them. They are very easy to rear in relation to an elephant, but very, very difficult to rehabilitate, because everything with rhinos works with chemistry and scent, and we don't know too much about that. But everything revolves around the dung piles and urinals. And uh, rhinos don't have very good eyesight, but that's not a defect, it's not a defect at all. It's only that they actually don't need their eyes. They only need their eyes for fighting. And I'm talking now about the black rhino. They're fiercely, fiercely territorial animals. 
And in order to re uh, re rehabilitate an orphaned rhino, you have to actually walk it around the dung piles and urinals of the wild ones for three years. And the little rhino will contribute its dung to these communal dung piles, kick its dung, put its scent on its feet, walk to the nearest bush, which is a urinal, um, spray urine against the bush, another rhino will come, detect a new scent there and think, now who's this? And they will follow the scent trail and go to the bush, take some of the urine in the mouth and through a special um, gland in the roof of the mouth will be able to know everything they need to know about that stranger. Bull, cow, big, little, stranger, you know, a rank of the, that individual and so on. But as the, the calf has walked around and leaving its scent everywhere, within three years it will be accepted as belonging in that community. You cannot just take a rhino and move it to another place. If there are established others in that place, it will be killed instantly. And I've had wonderful, wonderful experiences with the antelopes. I think of all the animals, elephants are very special, they're human animals, so they're slightly different. Uh, but the antelopes are equally as interesting. And I had one wonderful antelope called Bunty, an impala, that we raised from very newborn. And she was with us for 12 years. And I was with her, you know, she had uh, nine, offspring during those 12 years. She used to go and join the wild herd at night, and during the day she'd turn up at the lawn with the morning cup of tea as we were having our, our tea. She managed to outwit the old herd ram, because normally the females are kept in a, a very close uh, surveillance by the, the dominant male. And uh, she'd wait until some of the people were walking up to the um, headquarters. And then she'd rush towards the nearest human being. And uh, the old herd ram would be rushing after her to try and round her up. But eventually he got, he got quite used to this, the, the, uh, this wayward wife who didn't quite conform. And she spent the days with us and the nights with the wild ones. And I was with, the, uh, with her at the birth of all her babies. And they're always born before midday because the baby needs about six hours to get strong. And then they hide their babies for the first 10 days of life and just walk away. And that little fawn is like a sitting bird. It has no scent. And the mother's nowhere near it at night. But uh, she comes back in the morning and with a very low sound uh, will call the baby and the baby will come and join her. So Bunty used to bring her baby back to the lawn during the day and at the night, uh, during the night it was hiding out somewhere out in the bush. And that goes on for about 10 days. And I've had dick dicks and elands and all those and buffaloes as well. And, you know, it's been such a wonderful experience to, to have actually been able to raise these animals and to understand their mind and how, what makes them tick. And they're all on a different branch of life. And then I think to myself, why do humans think that they're above the animal kingdom? We are, after all, animals, and I think not very successful ones, really. You know, if suddenly the, all the lights went out in the world, how many of us would be able to survive in a wild situation? We've sort of stepped out of nature. And, you know, when you live in a wild place, it's, it's so, it's, it's solace. You know, you're at peace with nature. You, you can learn so much about it. And the best thing of all, you're never actually on your own. There's always something to interest you, always something to learn from, always something to wonder and marvel at. And one of the greatest marvels is all, of all has been raising the elephants and learning how they feel and think and learning how they communicate with one another and seeing the care and, and the emotions of them, which are identical to us, and how they love their, their babies, and how the little ones cared for by all the nannies, and the mother's very relaxed about it. She just hands over all the care to the nannies. And I was absolutely amazed with Malika's first baby that she brought back to show us, and I just happened to be there at the time when she came back with her baby. And uh, within a couple of days, this little baby's swimming in the water hole. We won't even let our little chap go into the mud bath in case he gets pneumonia. 
and uh, they're very, very fragile in infancy, and the milk is not absolutely right yet, so we have a lot of problems. So to raise the elephants, you need to know a bit about homeopathy, a little bit, a bit about veterinary care, a little bit about everything, but most of all, you have to understand just how very human they are and how very wonderful they are and how very sophisticated they are. So I'm just so, so... So grateful for the wonderful support that the David Sheldrick Trust has actually enjoyed from the public, which has enabled us to, to do this work. And we still do a lot of other things as well. The Orphans Project is just one of our main projects. And uh, everyone can help support the orphans by fostering an elephant. It's only $50 a year, and that's affordable to most people. And uh, in exchange for your fostering, thing, you get the Keeper's Diary, which chronicles on a daily basis everything that goes on with the orphans in all the rehabilitation phase as well. And uh, people become involved in, in a particular orphan, which is the uh, symbolic of them all, because the money goes into raising them all. So although you might foster an elephant, $50 a year is certainly not enough to raise an elephant. They're very expensive and so on. But, uh, you know, it's, it brings in most of the money we need and enables us to do a lot of other work as well. We run mobile veterinary units in Savo, helping the sick, the wounded, and the maimed. We have a, a surveillance plane there, helping the Kenya Wildlife Service to keep tabs on all the poaching and so on. We have eight anti-poaching teams picking up snares and, and doing all that work. We do whatever we can. And one of the most important things we are doing now is the protection of wild habitats. Because I see it all as a sort of holding action until people are more enlightened about the environment and take more care of it. And we've uh, been given a patch of forest, the Kibwezi forest, and we have control of that. And our US board has very generously raised the money to actually fence that forest. And uh, we've uh, built a beautiful little self-help lodge there where people can hire the, the lodge and take their own food, and it's a home from home from someone. And the money from that goes into the protection of the forest. We've, we're trying to uh, protect other wild lands too that hold a lot of wildlife, working in conjunction with the communities of those places. So, you know, we've been able to do all this thanks to the generosity and support of the public. And so I'm here tonight to launch my book, um, Love, Life and Elephants, an African love story. It's a love story about animals and it's a love story about my, my late husband as well. So I think that's all I've got to say, really. <laughs> Dame Daphne has agreed to answer a few questions before she heads out to do her book signing. So if you'd like to come to the microphone up here, we are happy to take a couple of questions. Hi, good evening. Um, I just wanted to find out if there's anything being done, um, knowing that the Asian countries are still very much into the ivory trade. Is there anything that the Sheldrick uh, Sheldrake um, Foundation, or is there anything that the public can do to um, move along a little bit, uh, uh, maybe into the 21st century, the, uh, the mentality of the Asian population as to um, ivory is not where it's at right now, and... Um, so rhino horns don't don't uh, cure cancers and, and unfortunately cancers. it's the demand in the far east that um, drives the poaching and uh, the chinese are very big in africa now in all african countries and they are actually facilitating the poaching they push the price of ivory up to poacher from 300 shillings a kilo to 25,000 shillings a kilo. Now, there's no welfare in African countries. There's a lot of poverty and a lot of unemployment as well. And uh, people cannot resist that sort of money. There's also a great deal of corruption. Now, the key to controlling the poaching 
lies in stopping the ivory trade. And as long as ivory is on the market, and the International Convention for Trade in Endangered Species has very misguidedly allowed the Southern African states to sell their ivory stockpiles, and that has fueled the poaching. Since they've sold the stockpiles in 2008, the poaching is completely out of control throughout Africa now, and it's beyond the capacity of local governments to actually control it, bearing in mind that there's a lot of corruption there too, and the temptation to get involved in big money is very big. And uh, so it rests with the international community through CITES, the International Convention for Trade in Endangered Species, to ban ivory, not just for a couple of years, like like they did in 1989, because it takes two years for an elephant to be born, but forever. And as long as there's a trade in ivory, there's going to be elephants killed. So it's a race against time now. You know, we all do what we can to, to limit the damage done in the field, but we cannot actually influence uh, Chinese government. That has to be the international community, but now, now must step in. And whenever CITES meets, they have to pressure their delegate to vote against uh, selling ivory and to ban it, to outlaw it totally. Because uh, some of the Southern African states think that if they sell ivory and flood the market with ivory, the poaching will stop. Well, unfortunately, it actually has increased it. Because the demand for ivory in, in the Far East is such that everyone wants an ivory trinket. It's a status symbol. It is also a symbolic value there. It's the biggest land mammal and the strongest, they think. And, you know, it's all about that. And the same with rhino horn. You know, they think it's a cure-all. It's actually just a fingernail. So if they all bit their fingernails, they'd be getting the same thing. So, you know, I've... <laughs> is, there, is there anything that the public can do um, you know, lobbying forms or anything that we can do to... Certainly. At CITES, the International Convention of Trade in Endangered Species, you all have delegates there. So you, you, you've got to pressure your, uh, pressure your delegate to vote the right way. You know, everyone's thinking about trade at CITES, not so much about the elephants. They haven't even got an elephant in their boundaries, most countries. But they all want to trade with China. Dame Sheldrick, earlier you mentioned that the uh, elephants knew the newborn uh, uh, transitioning, the transition convoy was approaching. And you mentioned telepathy. May I suggest, with all due respect, it was probably, probably the truck vibrations, since elephants do long range communicate with infrasound? Well, they uh, crossing the trucks go hundreds every day up and down the Nairobi Mombasa Road. So how can they detect one truck from another? They were the same trucks you always use, I presume? No, any truck. No, no, the trucks they detected were your trucks. Yes, but we use different trucks. We used to have to hire trucks in the beginning. We've ah. now got a, another truck that we've had specially made, which is uh, suitable for moving three elephants at a time. Just a thought. Yes. <laughs> Magic is unlikely. <laughs> Uh, what is it like to see an orphan elephant come in? Sorry? Um, what is it like to see an orphan elephant come in? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the... The question is, what is it like to see an orphaned elephant come in? Well, our hearts sink. Because with every orphan that comes in, you know that it's lost its mother and its family. They all come in completely traumatized, devastated, some of them wounded. Some of them just don't want to live. They just want to die. They won't feed and they do die. And uh, it's always very difficult to turn that around. And it can only be turned around with the input of the others that are established. They all come around and, and touch the baby and rumble to it and talk to it and comfort it. And that can turn a, a completely wild elephant round literally overnight. And we've had many instances where that's actually happened. A lot depends on what has happened to that elephant, what terrible things it's seen. Some of them that uh, one came in with a spear embedded 10 inches into its head here. And uh, that one took 10 days to settle down. Uh, 
Others that come in not too badly um, damaged may settle down overnight with the input of the other elephants. And if it's a very young calf that doesn't remember too much about what's happened, they can go straight away with the others and become part of the herd. They're always welcomed into the herd. Um, are you ever scared about your safety for the animals around you? Scared of animals? Like the safety, like if any of them are um, not really used to being around humans and they just attack. Yes, when sometimes when the older ones come in, that are two and older, they just want to kill. And we've got a special stockade where they go in, it has a partition in the middle, so that the elephant is uh, divided from the keeper. And that in order to get the keeper, it's got to run around the, the partition and the keeper can climb up onto a platform. And so, but with a, a lot of tender loving care and just talking to, gently to that elephant and feeding the others outside so that they, that newcomer can see them taking milk and everything, they soon settle down and eventually they all become fine. They go through a period of grieving where they behave a, in, in a, a little unusual way. They're a bit pushy and they're very greedy for the milk and they like to spend time on their own to, to, to remember and to mourn and a little bit away from the herd. That's all part of their sort of post-traumatic stress that they've been through, and that has to heal, and only time can heal that. Thank you. Describe your typical day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My typical day, I wake up every morning at five o'clock in the morning. I, I like to do my house when it's quiet and do all the dusting and think about things and how I'm going to manage my day. I then go out and every elephant has a book and the keepers will be writing in that book at the night exactly how it slept, how much food it has taken during the night, everything about the elephant, what sort of stool it's done and so on. I monitor the books, and that's the first indication I have of something possibly going wrong. And if I see something, there's a loss of appetite or anything with that animal, I'll go and question the keepers. And then I'll ask for a sample of the, of the dung, of the stool, because it's quite difficult to actually tell what's a normal stool in a, an artificially fed elephant and what's not. And uh, so that's where the expertise comes in. I then get into my office and answer a lot of emails and things. And at 11 o'clock, all the public come to see the elephants take their mud bath. And uh, I usually hide in my office at that time <laughs> uh, with the door shut, because otherwise it causes a traffic jam. And the keepers will be speaking to the public while the elephants are having their mud bath. And a lot of people will be fostering an elephant at that time. And we sell a few little things from the shop table there. And then the public go at 12 o'clock and everything gets quiet again. And then work carries on. And uh, by 8 o'clock at night, I'm usually so tired that I'm in bed. So for me, this is a very late night. And if I've been a bit sort of... <laughs> bit sort of was he? I've only been in, in, in uh, we flew straight from Nairobi through London to New York. I've had two days here of press and interviews and this and that for the launch of my book and I head home tomorrow. So it's been quite, quite a sort of strenuous trip for me. question. The elephant keepers, they seem like such wonderful people. Um, do they live on the ground since they sleep overnight with the elephants or for a certain time period or how does that work? Yes, if it's a very small elephant, the keeper will be on, on a mattress on the ground with the elephant. As they grow up and settle down, the keeper will be able to sleep in a small platform but within reach of the elephant's trunk. And it's very important that the little elephants have contact with their keepers 24 hours a day because a baby elephant would never be on its own. And it's very, very important to heal them psychologically because they've got to be normal when you expose them to the wild population. The wild elephants don't want to take on a problem. Uh, 
So if the elephant's too neurotic and not beha behaving normally, it will be rejected by the wild elephants. So the, the care and the, everything that happens in the nursery sets the, uh, the, the, the record for, for that elephant to be actually accepted into the wild community. And they help now by the ex-orphans who always come and, as I say, are waiting for them at the other end. And I don't think te telepathy is magic. I think there's some people <laughs> that can also have telepathy. And I can promise you that the elephants have it in abundance and so do the antelopes. The animal kingdom has the powers of tele telepathy. We've lost it. We've probably had it in the old days, but we don't use it now. So we, we have pens and papers and iPads and things, and we think this is civilization. I'm not sure that it is, in fact. <laughs> Dr. Dame Sheldrick, thank you so much for, uh, welcome to Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> we've waited a long time. I'm actually uh, fresh out of Nairobi on Thursday, so I, I have been there recently in the last week, and uh, we all thank you for your work. I have a unique question for you. Um, as an advocate for the African elephant, and I've studied them for a long time, hence my African elephant tattoos. Um, you know, reading literature from the 1950s and the 1960s and stuff and, you know, seeing these bull orphans and what have you, taking young baby elephants out of uh, Savo to the stockade, showing them, you know, uh, ostensibly, you know, friendly human beings. You know, when you read this literature, it always says, oh, they're showing off their babies to their, you know, their, their former keepers, what have you. How has your opinion evolved over the years, whereas saying, like, this African elephant is showing off a baby as opposed to saying, this is a safe place, like, these are people that you can come to if something happens to me. So, you know, from 50s, 1960s, now going into, you know, 2012, 2013, has your mindset evolved, of, like, you talk about the emotional intelligence of these animals, but, I mean, how do you feel now versus, say, 1960, 1960? Well, I've learned a lot from the elephants themselves. And our ex-orphans, whenever they're in trouble, and uh, if they've got poisoned arrows or snares or spear wounds or anything like that, and they need the help of the human family that raised them, they return to the stockades. Now, one elephant came back with a broken back leg and uh, went back into the old stockade. We hadn't seen him for many, many years but he was in trouble and he managed to get back and he was escorted by a friend, another orphan, who escorted him back into the stockade. And uh, we managed to heal that elephant. I said to the vet, now what do we do, an elephant with a broken leg? He said, if it was a horse, we'd shoot it. I said, this is an elephant, it's not a horse. And we're not going to shoot it, it's Salango. And we've raised him from just months old, we're going to do our best. And with homeopathy and tender loving care, and rest and everything, the bone healed. And when he wanted to leave the stockade, he rattled the door like that, and we opened it up, sure. and he uh, fed around the stockade for a long time, and then he went and joined the others. He's now living a wild life again. We've just had one that's come back with three arrow wounds, and our mobile veterinary unit immobilized this elephant, removed the arrows, and uh, we thought she'd be okay, long-acting antibiotic and so on, living wild. But she managed to hobble back to the stockades just the other day because the one arrow had gone into the joint of the foot. So we flew a vet down, immobilized her, cleaned out this wound again, more antibiotics. She's back in the stockade until that wound heals. Now, they've come back. One bull came back with a... a, a a snare around his leg that had cut right into the leg, and it was a steel cable. And he came back, and we hadn't seen him for a long time, and he stood outside the stockade, and he allowed the keepers to actually cut that snare with a sort of hacksaw, which must have involved a lot of 
yeah. a pain because they didn't have the right tools to take that snare off that elephant's leg. And he also had a wound here on his temporal gland, which involved a ladder to get up and clean out this wound and syringe it. And he stood absolutely stock still while they did this. So our elephants, it's a comfort for us to know that if they're in trouble and they can get back to the stockades, they do. And I think that shows an amazing amount of intelligence. It's not just to show off the baby. They... We're just going to take two more questions and then we'll let you go so you can start meeting all these people and signing books. Okay. <laughs> when, did you, when did you first know you loved elephants? Ooh, well, f when, when I had my first orphan, I guess, that's when I loved them so much. In the, I've always loved seeing them and uh, sort of uh, watching them in a wild situation and wondering why they, what they're doing and this and that. But to me, they were just wonderful animals. But when you raise them from the day they're born until they're grown, and uh, it's like having a, an elephant child. And then you really learn about them. You know the body language, you know how they feel and think, you know the individual, how it's, you know, some are uh, rambunctious, some are calm, some are gentle, some are more competitive. They're just like your own children. So I love them terribly now. And to, after having raised 140, <laughs> I've loved everyone very much. Thank you. Habari mama? Jambo sana. Alhamdulillah. Oh, mimi ni wale kantai, mimi ni Masai kutoka sehemu ya Naro. Na nashukuru sana kwa maana mimi najua hii wanyama hawezi ongea, lakini wewe umefanya kazi nzuri kwa maana unaongea ni aba yao kwa maana kwa kweli wana wana mdomo. Uh -huh. Na nauliza bwana wapo na kuja sehemu ya Masai Mara huko pande uh, pande ile nyingine peke yake na they've grown up with. So uh, we've got lots of babies from the Maasai Mara. Um, so we, we do our best. But oh. to actually rehabilitate them takes a long time, and that happens in Salvo. Oh, okay. Okay, Asante Sana. Hiya, Asante. We have one last question for you. Do... Do the humans make the elephants sick? Some, some humans make elephants very sick because they want them to die so that they can take their tusks and sell the ivory. But uh, these little sick elephants that come to us, we try to heal them and we do our very best. Thank you.